Thank you, Kyle, uh, Kyle for that amazing uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I've been fascinated with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics since I was a kid. And STEM subjects continue to be themes in my sort of dual careers as a DJ and as an ecologist, and as also in my hobbies. I want to leave you with two messages today. The first is that your inspiration to engage with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines can come from many different things. And second, if you choose to pursue a STEM career, you're well positioned to make a comfortable living while doing important and rewarding work that improves our world. So just down the laneway from the house I grew up in was a small marsh and each spring immediately after ice out, wood frogs would miraculously appear to spawn in the marsh. And I've always loved frogs and I spent lots of hours sort of observing their behavior and trying to catch them. And one of the earliest scientific curiosities I remember having is how these little critters could survive our frigid winters to emerge from the mud and from under the leaves in the spring ready to reproduce. And I learned years later that when temperatures get cold, these animals actually pump natural antifreezes like sugars and urea into their blood and tissues, which lowers their freezing point so they don't turn into frog sickles. In my high school days, my dad often took me fishing for smallmouth bass. One of our favorite lures was the Rapala Shadrap. If the fishing was sh slow, as it sometimes was, I'd sit in the boat and contemplate stuff. Why balsa wood as the body material? How do they shape each lure so perfectly? Is there a trade-off between hook set performance and the wiggling action that's so vital for bass? And, it, and how is that related to the proportions of the lure? And how did, how did they optimize that? Could other shapes of the plastic flange at the front of the lure give better diving action or wiggling? So these little contemplations made me realize that scientists and engineers don't just create fancy lunar landers and theories about nature. If you think about any manufactured item that you use, it will immediately become obvious to you that scientists and engineers had a hand in designing and building that item. Uh, this is the bike that I rode in the 2015 Muskoka Ironman race. It's made of ultralight and strong carbon fiber. It puts the rider's position in a, uh, it puts the rider's body in a position that trades off a little bit of power uh, for an aerodynamic position that's vital in a race in which you're not allowed to follow too closely to the rider in front of you in their slipstream. So you can easily spend $7,500, $10,000 or more on a bike like this. And revenue from the sale of this sort of equipment does trickle down to support people working in material science, uh, developers of software for technical design, mechanical engineers, and even scientists working in biomechanics. People with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics skills are in demand, and as we heard earlier, they're paid as talent, not as labor. I haven't done this yet today, but I can twist a knob on my DJ mixer back there and filter out certain frequencies, which sounds really cool when you're mixing out from one track to another. I can put my hand on one of the platters and move it back and forth, which advances and pulls back the audio signal past the play point, changing its pitch and causing this sort of scratching sound that you all associate with DJs. Given a little bit of skill with coding, I can actually program my own effects into any button or any dial on that mixer. So my point here is that if you add your own creativity and ingenuity into a, any tech device, including my DJ mixer, you can produce wow. So I want to end my short talk here with a little story from my PhD work in boreal ecology. So I work at, uh, up in Dorset, and at the Dorset Environmental Science Centre, they've been sampling uh, benthic invertebrates, which are little bottom-dwelling creepy crawlies in the sediments of lakes and rivers, mayflies, uh, crayfish, worms, leeches, that sort of thing. Uh, and they've been sam sampling water chemistry in 19 lakes since 1993. And I looked through their data set using a graphical user interface for the uh, statistical programming language known as R. And after, it took me a little while, but after learning R's syntax, what used to take weeks or months in Microsoft Excel, the spreadsheet program, I could do in minutes. So in my PhD project, I built hundreds of statistical models, created thousands of graphs, and compiled manuscript-ready summary tables using relatively simple code scripts. 
So in DJing and in my PhD, I learned that having a bit of coding know-how allows you to develop and adapt available tech to your needs. It makes your work easier, more efficient, and more rewarding. So, and all of this creates opportunities for innovation. So that's my plug for learning just a little bit of coding while you're going through your school. Uh, anyways, getting back to the lake data set, I noticed that calcium was declining in 13 of the 19 lakes. So what you're seeing here on the screen is a scatter plot matrix. So each pane is a graph for a single lake and each graph has year on the horizontal axis and calcium on the vertical axis. The dots represent individual calcium concentrations observed in any given year. The trend over time is represented as the solid black line in each pane. And you can see that there's negative slopes uh, in most of the panes indicating declining calcium. Now amphipods, little freshwater shrimp, have a high demand for calcium because of their calcified exoskeleton, which they have to cast off every time they molt and grow. According to laboratory studies, they start to suffer metabolic stress when calcium concentrations fall below about five milligrams per liter, a concentration that most of Muskoka's lakes are already below. So I mined the long-term data set for any evidence of effects on amphipod populations. And lo and behold, amphipods are declining in 13 of 19 lakes. So this plot is exactly the same as the last one I showed, except on this one, I plotted amphipod abundances over time rather than calcium over time. So I now have a paper in revision with a renowned scientific journal in which some colleagues and I investigate the association between calcium concentration in lake water and amphipod decline. And we discuss how lo losing amphipods might influence lake food webs. And so it goes. A hypothesis leads to a study and ultimately to a slight advancement of the collective knowledge of our species. If you're a curious person, stick with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You'll never run out of questions, you'll make a comfortable living, and you'll make an important contribution to our world. You are the future. Be the change. Thank you.